<laughs> I think this will do just fine. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Garmin. This, of course, is the Storycraft Society, and this week I have a question for you. Have you ever had one of those times that you think of something so ridiculous and just totally off the wall that you're like, I have to figure this out right now? Well, guess what? That's what happened to me this week. And the question that I had to myself was, can I make a fifth edition Dungeons & Dragons combat encounter with absolutely nothing to fight in it? Now, I don't know if this is gonna be really easy to do or if it's gonna be really hard to do, but the good news is, is that at the end of the video, you get to let me know in the comments down below whether I did it or I didn't. Also, obviously, you can share ideas of things that I could have done better or that you would have done differently. I have a really specific idea of what the scene is gonna look like, so that's where we're gonna start. I'm gonna start pulling out some terrain and we're gonna get the scene set up and then we're gonna talk about it. Let's go. All right, so while setting up this scene, I knew I had three important areas that I needed to have. Number one is the main hallway that was entering the cavern space. Number two was the decoy statue in the center surrounded by stalagmites. And then the final was the fountain up at the very top of the structure. These three are gonna play an important role later as they're going to be the challenges that the players have to overcome both mechanically with what's on their character sheet and mentally as players when things don't go right. The size of the room was important. I wanted to make sure that there was no way that a character could get to the statue in the center of the room in one movement unless they were a special type of character, right? So a monk or a rogue could probably do it faster. A wizard could do it with a teleport, but we're gonna talk in a little bit about how to balance this encounter uh, for lower level players versus high level players, because just honestly, when players have access to things like teleport, it makes things a lot more tricky, but I have ideas for that. And the last thing that I have to say about this is that if you wanna make any of the terrain that you see here, I've deliberately only used terrain that we've made here on the channel, so I will make sure to link all of these in the description below so that you know how to make all of this stuff if you would like to craft and make all this stuff for yourself. So, uh, with that said, now we can start diving into what each area does. Hey everyone, while I was editing the video, I actually realized that this video would do really well with some kind of an actual write-up of this adventure site. So I decided to throw it onto the Storycraft Society's drive through RPG page. So if you wanna check that out, I've linked that in the description below. Uh, it's free, you can download it and you can run it for your friends or you can look at it to follow along with the video or don't download it, that's fine too. But it's free over there and if you're interested, you can go check it out. Like I said, the link is in the description below. All right, so the way that this is all going to work and it's going to feel like a combat encounter is that we're going to run it all in initiative. It's really important that different sections of the room are doing different things on different initiative counts. That way it makes the drama of the room that much more intense as one player is lucky enough to roll high in initiative to go before something happens and someone is unlucky enough to roll low on initiative and the players then all have to figure out when they individually can use their talents inside of this order. So let's start at the top. The very first thing that's going to happen when one of the PCs walks through the open doorway into the room, that will make it that all of a sudden the door goes to slam shut. Any PC within 10 feet of that door will need to succeed on a dexterity saving throw. If they do, they will get to choose whether they want to be on the inside of the room or out in the hallway. If they fail, they are automatically pushed out into the hallway. Now, that door slams shut and there is absolutely no way to open it until the following initiative count 20. When that happens, the door will come back open again. Now, the way that I see this is, is that the mages or clerics who made this trap room decided that they knew the order of events so they could plan out exactly how to disable the room very, very quickly. For players, they don't know what this pattern is yet, and part of the drama is figuring out the patterns of the room. Moving along, now we'll go into the next big section of the room, which is gonna be where the four 
pillars are. On initiative count 13, there will be a gravitational pull that will pull any player within a 70 foot cube around that statue immediately to the statue. The next thing that happens is the kill box. That means that anyone who is within the stone area of this room, likely pulled there from the tractor beam that pulls them in, they're going to have to make a constitution saving throw or take shock damage. Now the amount of shock damage we're gonna talk about when we get into the section of low level versus high level, but there will be some kind of shock damage that happens in there. With that said, we have initiative count 20 is when the door opens and closes. We have initiative count 13 where we'll have the tractor beam pull anyone inside that 70 foot cube into the statue. And then we'll have on initiative count 12, the shock trap that does damage to anyone who fails a constitution saving throw. All of that said, now we need to figure out what makes this room tick? Why are the players going in this room to begin with? So when I started thinking about this little particular challenge in my head, I didn't think about a good reason why the players would be here. That doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a good reason, and certainly the more that I've worked on this, the more I've come up with a reason in my head. What I really don't want to do is tell you that this is the only way that this encounter can be ran. I think that if you like the idea of it enough, you can make it fit anything that you want. They could be coming here to get an item out of this room. This could be a secret treasury in some castle or something. It could be a lot of different things. And that leads me to the next most important thing to talk about, which is how do our players solve this puzzle room? And the answer is, of the four stalagmites here in the center, three of them have buttons that are relatively easy to see. But there is also a button way up here, up behind this fountain. On purpose, we want this area to stand out so the players think there is likely something up here. This isn't one of those gotcha moments where it's like, oh, you didn't look behind that one stalagmite that you should have looked behind. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure our players can figure the puzzle out. But once they find one button on one of these stalagmites, they're gonna assume that the buttons are on all of them. And when they find out that this one, this one, and this one have it, but this one doesn't, they'll be looking, hopefully, for a fourth button. Investigating around here will find it. Once all buttons are depressed, all the traps are deactivated. The last thing that I think is really important that I wanted to add as a feature of this puzzle, you know, no combat, combat encounter, is that the buttons, when they're pushed, will only stay pushed for 1d4 rounds. What this is gonna solve is that's not gonna let your monk or rogue character, who's already going to shine in this encounter, by the way, to be able to just run and hit every button and basically make it so that no one else has to be a part of this. I feel like a really good puzzle room will engage all of the players and it's not just that one player is running around doing all of the work. So the last thing that we have to do for this is jump up to the table and talk about how to set the DCs for this room as well as to set the amount of shock damage that the shock trap will deal. We're also gonna talk about how to scale this up into higher levels as well, but I will see you up at the table. When I'm setting all of the DCs and damage for my traps like this, I really like to use a reference so that I make sure I'm not making it way too easy or way too hard for my players. Xanathar's Guide to Everything actually has a whole section called Traps Revisited, and I like to go specifically to page 116, where there is a trap save DCs and attack bonuses chart, there is a damage severity by level chart, and a spell equivalent by level chart. We're only gonna be looking at the top two today, but all three are really useful. So the first thing that we're gonna do is talk about the door. So the door has absolutely no damage associated with it, right? When the door slams shut for the first time, the players are either gonna be on the inside or the outside of the door, and that doesn't really change anything for the encounter other than scaring them at the beginning of the encounter, right? According to this, it says that a dangerous trap save DC is DC 15. So I'm actually going to set that first one at dangerous because there's really no real danger other than tension that will show up from it. Even at first level, players are very unlikely to succeed and let's say they all fail. That just means that they're going to be outside of the door for the first six seconds and then the door is going to open again. Moving on to notice the buttons. That's going to be a skill check, not a saving throw, but to notice the buttons, I'm going to set that at DC 10. Why? Well, they need to be able to see the buttons to be able to successfully navigate the room. They're not going to be able to see the button all the way up in the back behind the fountain. So at that point, we really need to make seeing the first three buttons 
really, really easy. So now let's move on the strength save to get pulled into the statue and the con save for the shock damage. This could be very deadly and do not put the option of a TPK on the table unless you are willing as a DM to TPK your players. I think that that's one of the worst mistakes that you can make is say, well, I want there to be drama, so I'm going to add a TPK type situation, but I'm also not willing to TPK my players. That's where all kinds of bad things can happen. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and call these a DC 10 as well. Now, speaking of shock damage, let's talk about that for a second. So according to this chart, it says for character level one through four, moderate damage is 1d10. This shock is gonna be going off every single round. And a d10 could put down a first level wizard character, like literally put down a first level wizard character. I don't like that. I think that that's too much risk. So I'm going to drop that actually down to a D4. It's enough that it'll take enough hit points away if you roll a four to scare the barbarian, but also enough that you won't outright kill one of your low hit point players. But we're not totally done because now we need to talk about how to scale this up for higher levels. And this room is actually fairly simple. The first thing that I'll do for super high level characters, so we're talking about somewhere around seven or higher, is I'm going to add an anti-magic field to this entire room while the door is closed. That way you as a DM don't have to track another thing in this encounter. You just need to remember that when the door shuts, everything that is magical in the room no longer is magical other than the traps. The next thing is just raise your DCs and damage type. By the time you get to level five, maybe you want the DC for all of these things to be maybe two or so points higher. So with that said, let's jump into the outro and, uh, and wrap this video up. So there you have it. There is a combat encounter with absolutely no combat in it. Did I do a good job? Definitely let me know in the comments below. What changes would you make, if any, to this? What's a reason that you would have your players going into a room like this? That's what's fun about this. I can't wait to hear everybody's ideas down in the comments below. But with that said, that is all I have for this video. So if you like this content, definitely leave me a like down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and share this video with a friend that you think would enjoy it. That is the best way that you can help a small YouTube channel out. There's a lot of new faces here on the channel and I'm so excited to see all of you coming in. Welcome to the Storycraft Society. I can't wait to make more content for you. So that's all I have to say. So until next week, I'll be seeing you.